Okay, here's our plan tonight, lesson two. So we are going to be doing the rest of your assessment. But first I wanna talk about, see if I can make me a little smaller here for now. Um, first, I wanna say, look at your checklist. What did you learn last night? I certainly hope that you learned where your tongue should be. Maybe it's not there right now, which is okay, because you're in the right place, but where it should be. Ideally, the tongue needs to be in the roof of the mouth completely, tip to tail. The whole tongue needs to be up, okay? Not just the tip. Uh, hopefully you learned about breathing, nasal breathing, why you need to nasal breathe, why mouth breathing is bad. Um, swallowing, we talked about swallowing, digestion. Hopefully, everything that we covered last night, you have a pretty good handle on. If you look at your discovery checklist and you see a whole bunch of writing on there, you're onto something, you know that you have concerns. So we will be building on that tonight. So let's just jump into toxic oral habits. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger now, maybe for a little bit. And maybe get me out of the way. Okay. And of course, there we go. Oh gosh, and then I just put me right in the way. So when I'm looking at toxic oral habits, especially with an adult, I really don't have adults very often that have oral habits, but they did. So thumb sucking, finger sucking, rock coat. I'm telling you guys, I've had clients that put everything in their mouth. I've had a little boy who chewed on a rock. I've had somebody who chews on a coat. I've had somebody who chews on a toe. Um, think about prolonged bottle use, pacifier use, any other habit. Really, you guys, anything that is in the mouth prevents you from swallowing correctly. I, I debate this quite often with people who say, well, I swallow fine. You can't, you, I, I call it a guaranteed tongue thrust. When you had something in the mouth that prevents you from swallowing correctly, you have a tongue thrust. So whether that was the thumb, the finger, whether you chew on pencils, you swallow 1,200 to 2,000 times per day. If you're chewing on a bobby pin, you're not taking that out every time you swallow. So that's really what we're looking at. Obviously, when I work with younger kids, we have to correct those toxic oral habits. Anybody who has a habit really past the age of three is a concern, but when I start working with adults, that's really the information that I'm gathering here is their swallow. I know that if they, if they sucked their thumb for a long time, that their swallow was altered. Okay. Tongue tie history. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm very used to it by now. And when I look at this section of the discovery checklist, I'm looking to see if, you know, if a, if a tongue tie has been previously diagnosed and if they had a release as a baby or family members. So first of all, if you had a release as a baby, it's probably not perfect. It's probably not what you need. I um, always have to tell people that there's a big difference between doing a release of an anterior tongue tie on an infant versus a full, complete release on a grown man. So there's a big difference. Um, even when I see kiddos, and I'm always blindsiding parents when I say, yeah, he was released so that it, he could uh, breastfeed, but it's not perfect forever, okay? So if you had a release as a baby, big red flag that you probably need another one, and it's important to do it with myofunctional therapy, okay? Um, do you have family members with ties? Brother, sister, Uncle Joe, do you have other children? I have so many parents, moms and dads, that, that email me or they schedule an exam with me and they say, well, we didn't know anything about this until our children had tongue ties and now we wonder if we do. Well, it's coming from somewhere. So there is definitely a familial hereditary component to this. It's 50-50. 
I always say if, if somebody is sitting in front of me and they tell me about their whole family having tongue ties and you're wondering about whether you have one, you could probably check it off, okay? Uh, has your tie been previously diagnosed? And that one's easy. And who suspects your tie? That's easy for me because I rarely ever say to somebody, you don't have a tie. If, if they're referred to me because they suspect a tie, I rarely say your doctor is wrong. And that's really because for every hundred people that are told, you know, like doctors miss it all the time. So if a doctor said you, I think you have a tongue tie, we're going with that because I've never had it be the opposite. I've had to argue the other direction <coughs> where I'm saying your doctor was wrong but it's not normal that somebody tells you that you have a tongue tie and, and I correct them, okay? Um, and then labial ties or buckle ties. So labial and buckle, it's all the same area. It's in this vestibule of your cheeks. It just depends on if it's from the premolars forward, okay? Um, they typically travel with tongue ties. A lot of providers will say they wanna fix one or the other I am all about efficiency and I don't see a reason to not do them all together. So that's always what I encourage. But if you have been told that you have other ties, did they check for a tongue tie, okay? All right, now the fun stuff, you guys. So the functional assessment. This is where we're going to look at how your, how your tongue functions, so how the muscles function. So I, when I'm doing this functional assessment, with somebody, I'm looking at general tests and I'm looking at functional tests. What I want you to know about this part of, of the exam with somebody is it's just a piece of the puzzle because we're gonna do this portion of it and then we're gonna continue on because there is more information to gather. This isn't the end all be all and it, I don't give it any more weight than I do gathering information for somebody's functional assessment or their myofunctional impairment, okay? So the general test, there's three of those. I look at tongue range of motion. I look at the alterations to the shape of the tongue during elevation. And then I look at the frenum fixation. So that's where it inserts on both ends. So it inserts into the tongue and it inserts to the floor of the mouth or to the alveolar ridge. So first, let's start with tongue range of motion. You guys, this is not rocket science. This is just a percentage of change between two measurements. Those two measurements are max opening and the max opening with the tongue tip to the incisive papilla. How's that for a mouthful? Um, what that means is you're reaching your tongue up to the spot, if you've heard that word. Um, the speed bump right behind the top front teeth, okay? So we're looking at that percentage of change. Obviously, everybody's not gonna look like me, so I have a 100% range of motion. Somebody who has a tongue tie, they change, and that, that percentage changes. So they have to close down to make contact with that incisive papilla, which is that speed bump, okay? Um, next, we look at alterations during elevation. So you'll be opening the mouth wide. You're going to raise the tongue up without touching the palate. So the goal is not to touch that incisive papilla. It's just to open really wide and raise the tongue up. So you're looking at the shape of the tongue. Um, what does it look like? Is it oblong? Is it square across the top? Is it heart shaped? When you look at mine, you can see it's pointed. So mine's normal. And we're gonna look at a couple variations here. And then last with the general test is the frenum fixation. So does it attach on the bottom to the floor of the mouth or the alveolar ridge? So the alveolar ridge is your bone here, okay? So the, on the inside of that. Um, does it have Eiffel Tower appearance? We're gonna look at one of those. Then when it inserts on the other side of the tongue, on, on the underneath of the tongue, where does it insert? Is it in the middle? Is it at the apex or the tip? Is it somewhere in between? So those are the general tests. Oops. So 
This, um, this picture here with the tongue range of motion with this measurement, not everybody has this because they don't get this until they do therapy with me and they, then they get their kit. But what I wanted to show you here is, I guess if I look on this screen, I have a pointer. Um, in this picture, this is wide open. And so that looks like it's about probably 56. And then over here, this is with the tongue up. So you can see the tongue is lifted and that looks like it's 44. So this person in this example has a 79% range of motion, which is pretty good. Okay, and we'll look at that here in just a second. Uh, but again, remember I said it's not rocket science. I, I don't have this information when I first am meeting somebody. And if you're sitting here wondering whether you have a tongue tie or not, and you're in the same situation, open wide. Close down to touch the spot. What does that look like? If you have to close down 50%, you've got a concern. If you don't feel like you close down at all, you may not. But again, remember, it's all about impairment. It's about what does the rest of your paper look like. So the tongue range of motion ratio is now a validated objective tool to allow clinicians to the ability to, to communicate the range of motion or tongue mobility. And that is thanks to Dr. Zaghi. So last night I mentioned that there's no black and white in diagnosing tongue ties. And, and it still is not the only thing. Some providers think that this is the only way. It's a terrible practice, I'm telling you, um, because it doesn't, it, it doesn't take into consideration everything else, but it at least is somewhat useful. So when you look at tongue tie grades, there's four. So we've got grade one that has greater than 80% range of motion. So that's gonna be somebody who's in the 10th percentile, okay? So that's me, I have 100% range of motion. I don't have to close at all. Um, then grade two is gonna be somebody with 50 to 80%, so that's average. Grade three is gonna be less than 50% range of motion, and grade four is less than 25, which is the bottom 10th percentile. So, when I just said that doctors who only use this for diagnosing, they miss the boat a lot because a lot of doctors are trained that you only need to be concerned about a tongue tie if there's a speech impediment. You only need to be concerned about a tongue tie if you can't lick an ice cream cone. You only need to be concerned if it's less than 50%. So, what about that person who has 49% range of motion and this big, terrible myofunctional impairment snapshot? That person deserves to, to have it fixed and it deserve, that person deserves to have it fixed by a, a tongue savvy, knowledgeable provider, okay? Um, I have had clients that I have referred for phrenectomies that have 78% range of motion, which is average. You know, they fall in that 50 to 80%. She had good mobility, but she had a tongue tie. She had area, you know, it was affecting her oral function, but she had so much else going on. Um, does 80% opening need a revision? So that's what I was just saying. That's a great question. I, have, I haven't referred somebody with 80%. Um, but I have referred somebody with 78% and she had fantastic results. Her biggest concerns in that case, um, she had digestive issues. She had sleeping issues and I think some snoring. So she had great results. But here's the thing. So you guys, if you've been following me for a while, you have heard me say all the time, arm yourself with knowledge, arm yourself with knowledge. That's what I'm doing here. And, the, and these lessons for you is helping you understand this because she went to a doctor who was of the mindset that you only do a release if, it's, if there's less than 50% range of motion. She pulled out her report from Carmen Woodland and said, well, I think I would like a release anyhow because I have these concerns. And he, thankfully, I mean, you guys, I don't feel like you should have to talk your provider into doing it. So he obviously wasn't somebody that I had worked with, but she said, based on her recommendations, her functional assessment, and what else is going wrong, I would like to have a release. So that, that worked in that case. I have some clients that 
go to a provider and they're turned away because they're told that it's fine. And that's awful. And it happens all the time, so we find somebody else. That's why I work so hard to find people who are reputable, who are tongue-tie savvy. If they don't talk about myofunctional therapy, if they don't talk about breathing, if they don't ask about your sleep, if they don't ask about tongue posture, they're out of here. You need to run from that building like it's on fire because it's not your person. So I don't want you to spend so much time educating somebody who doesn't get it. I want you to find somebody who does. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, so one last thing really on grades of tongue ties. Most of my clients are grade three, grade four. My worst client has been 9% range of motion. And that's huge. That, that's life changing for that person. What is sad is that they get to teenage years or older with that kind of restriction. Okay, so let's talk about what what is meant by grade three compensating to a grade two or what whatever. Um, it, it could be grade two compensating to a grade one. So what that means, and the reason I want to touch on this is because I have a, a lot of clients that go to Dr. Zoggy. They go to other professionals who have been trained by Dr. Zoggy. So they understand the grading of the tongue tie, but there's also that compensation where the body is helping you out. So somebody who has a grade three, remember a grade three is worse than a grade two. So somebody who has grade three, but compensating to a grade two, just means that while they should be between um, this percentage, they should, they, they're between, or they're less than 50%, but their body, like they're forcing it. So they're forcing to be better, which they are now, but they're not going to always be. So how they typically identify that and they'll say that it's compensating, like if you're in Dr. Zoggy's office, they'll glove up, they'll push in the floor of the mouth. Because when you elevate the tongue, the floor of the mouth isn't supposed to come with it. So that's what happens is a lot of people, it looks like there's a suction cup. They pull their tongue or they elevate their tongue and it pulls the floor of the mouth with it. So that just means that if they push the floor of the mouth down where it needs to be, that, that changes their range of motion. So I hope that makes sense. It just makes you think that you're better than you are. And that isn't always going to be that way because the day is going to come where your body gets tired of helping you. But that's what that means. Remember, the higher grades reflect more lingual restriction. I brought it up here to say that Dr. Zoggy had now made the tongue range of motion ratio an objective tool for us to use, but some people don't use it, some providers don't use it, and I do get asked a lot why there's so much variation, and, and all I can say is hopefully eventually that it will catch up, but if somebody says you have a grade one, that's the best. You, you really don't have any concerns, so I would say, somebody would say I have a grade one. And a lot of people reach out to me and they say, okay, you teach about this stuff, but when are you gonna take care of your own tongue tie? I have a freedom and we all have a freedom. I just have a very pronounced one. But remember, it's not about the appearance, it's about function. Okay, so the next general test is um, alterations to shape. So if you look at this picture here, this little guy, gosh, I don't know where to put this picture of me. Um, when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at how the shape of the tongue is when it's lifted, okay? Is it oblong, square? Is it heart-shaped? The heart-shaped, that, that's the low hanging fruit. So this picture is obviously somebody who's tied. And, and this little guy used to call it his butt tongue. And I was really sad that he was, you know, 11 years, no, nine years old and had been going to the dentist every six months since he was two and nobody had ever told him that he had a tongue tie. So they just knew he was different and they just called it his butt tongue because as soon as he lifted it, it looked like two little butt cheeks, okay? So that's what we're looking at. Let's look at the next one. Um, then the next uh, test is where, the next general test is where is the, the frenum fixating? So remember I said underneath and in the floor of the mouth. So on this case, on this picture, 
we can see here that it inserts right here. So I wouldn't call that the middle of the tongue. And we're going to talk here in just a second on some different, um, different types of freedoms. I call this common sense, okay? And I, I, I'm not saying this can, to confuse anybody, but I want you also to look at this with common sense, okay? So in this picture, I see a frenum that attaches right back here. It's not the middle of the tongue. It's not between the middle of the tongue and the tip of the tongue, which is worse, but it obviously has a concern. So in my eyes, it it's inserts back here, but it's just shorter. It's just shorter than it could than it should be. I can see that it's pulling when she lifts, elevates the tip. And then, uh, so insertion is here and then here. So this was the alveolar ridge that I was talking about. And we're gonna have a better picture of it here in just a minute, but this is an Eiffel Tower tie. He, right here it is. So this, this is that same picture just blown up, but you can see how the legs spread here. I have had some clients where it fans out from canine to canine because they had such a massive tie. This is a better picture also to show you that it looks like this frenum is inserting way back here. Where does the literature show that, you know? So that's why I say this is common sense. People can send me a picture and before I know anything about them, just looking at it sometimes common sense wise, you're like, oh my gosh, this absolutely looks miserable. Uh, and you can see that here. Here's another example, another person who made it to teenagerhood before somebody said there was a tongue tie. This is an example of, I think this was 9%, maybe 14% range of motion, a severe tie. A client of mine that, believe it or not, could sing, could, could do so many amazing things, but nobody had ever really said that this was a big deal. Um, but it's not really changing the shape of the tongue a lot because it really can't, but it, it's definitely low hanging fruit, but you can see where it inserts. It inserts at the alveolar ridge and it inserts at the tip, at the apex. So let's talk about those different freedom types that I just mentioned. And this is where I say we talk a lot about um, common sense. And that is because there's normal, there's anterior, there's short, there's short and anterior, and then there's ankyloglossia. So a normal one considers, is considered to attach normally in the right places, okay? Remember what are the exact right places. That last picture that I just showed you with the Eiffel Tower tie that looks like it's inserted way back here and looks like it's short, that was my granddaughter who was overlooked for years and years and years. Lots of issues. Tongue tie, you know, has a release and, and it's been beautiful. It was the answer that solved all of her problems. Um, then you have anterior. So that's the frenum that attaches between the middle and the tip. So we've talked about that. So it attaches out here. Then you have short. And so this is attached normally, but it's shorter than normal. So common sense. Then you have short and anterior. So, I mean, it keeps getting worse, right? If it's short and then it's out here, it was bad anyhow because it was short or because it was anterior. And now we're getting worse. And then you have ankyloglossia, which total ankyloglossia means you can't lift the tongue out of the floor of the mouth. I haven't seen that. I mean, I feel like that one I just showed you is pretty severe. The, the worst that I have seen is nine, but I mean, I've had some clients that are so tongue tied they can't even get the tongue to the spot. So we can't, I can't necessarily do the traditional pre-procedure therapy with them. So total ankyloglossia is rare. However, as you're looking at your tongue, as you're putting yourself through the test that we're gonna do here in a minute, use common sense also. You guys, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to necessarily get this wrong. If you if you suspect that you have a tongue tie, and remember, we'll talk more about this tomorrow too. If you suspect you have a tongue tie and you go to a tongue tie savvy provider and you talk about all the things that are wrong, they're gonna fix that for you. So you're not getting, you're not gonna lose your retirement here. You're not selling body parts, okay? 
Okay, let's see where we're at now. Functional test. So this is the fun, fun stuff. It's the active stuff. If you have a hand mirror, when you do this, watch yourself. Better yet, have somebody watch you do it or watch yourself in, in, like in the bathroom mirror. So first, we're going to look at can you elevate the whole tongue? So in this picture, you can see that when I elevate here, I, I use the phrase a lot of think of your tongue like a diving board or a piece of lumber. For kids, I use the word pickle. Um, but what I'm wanting them to understand is I we're not just worried about the tip. I, I want them to show me if they can elevate the whole tongue. So I ask them if they can elevate it like a, a diving board or a piece of wood. So what I what you can see here in this picture is my whole tongue is up. The arrow is pointing back here to the dorsum of the tongue and a great way to see if, if you can is um, first you can take the back of the tongue and just kind of act like you're, you're, play, you're using your soft palate as a punching bag. So if you can do this. Some people who don't know that they have a tie, they can't even feel this. They can't even lift the back of their tongue. So first of all, I see if you can lift the back of your tongue. Can you elevate the whole tongue? Can you distinctly elevate the back and then the tip? So hopefully without messing things up here, I am going to switch screens just so you can see me. First, I'll show you what I do just to warm up. Like, can you feel the back of your tongue working? And then can you elevate the back and the tip, the front, like a board? Simple as that. I know I make it look a lot easier. So that's what we're looking for on can you elevate the whole tongue, okay? Let's, let me switch back here, go to the next one. So in this picture, it's just showing you from a different angle. So you can see that my tongue is lifted. The whole thing's elevated. It's off of the teeth down here. I'm not using my lips. I'm not compensating. This is really hard for people with impairment and with a tongue tie is because they want to lift with their training wheels. Okay, the next one is protract and retrude. Protract and retrude, I thought I had them backwards. So this picture of my granddaughter, you can see here, she had no muscle tone. She had no, um, no control. A lot of people, when I ask them to stick the tongue out like a diving board, it's dropping down. So you can just look at her tongue and, and form two opinions. Number one, she is so weak, she can't hold it up. Or number two, there's that tie underneath that's pulling it. And in her case, that's what was going on. But she has no, no strength here, her lips or her tongue. Whereas if we look at mine, I have control. It's strong. I always say that my tongue is strong and beefy. Um, my granddaughter's, her, this is a pancake. Me, this is a pickle. So there's a big difference. So we look at how you stick your tongue out and how you retract it. I think I have a picture. Here's a picture of me retracting it. So I'm bringing the tip of it back. So as you have yourself try that, watch to see. Do you have control? Can you say, hey brain, stick your tongue out. Stick your tongue out like a board and if it flops out a pancake, then you have a concern. You're not doing it very well, okay? Now, lateralization will go side to side. So um, it, it goes both directions. I'm gonna switch over here so you can watch. This is one of the biggies that that's so hard because you a lot of people with the tongue tight, they can't elevate, so they can't get that board. But now, now I'm asking you to take it sideways. So how it should look in somebody who is doing it correctly is like I say, you, you have a pie, you're gonna slice it in half. So I want to see the tongue off of the teeth. I don't wanna see any funny business here. I don't wanna see any strain. Uh, and you're just going back and forth. So 
slow and steady. People who have a tongue tie, if you can visualize that restriction underneath, they go and they fall on the corners. And very often people who have a tongue tie, I can see that restriction as they move. So really tongue, um, tongue points or this lateralization is really an important assessment because so many people can't do it. So if you're trying it at home, that's what you're trying to do to see how you do. Can you do it? Uh, and we'll talk about what it feels like here in a minute, but as you're doing this, and when I'm evaluating somebody, I'm seeing, can you do it? Can you do it at all? Do you suck because you don't have any control? Um, what's the struggle look like? Um, how bad is it? Is it just weakness or is it a tie? Again, with this one, I can see when people have a tongue tie in that restriction because I can see it. It's like a rope under there. Okay, let's see what is next. Okay, can you reach the last molar? So in this picture, you can see that I'm reaching. I think there's one more. So this is the top, this is the bottom. So you can see that I have mobility. I can clean. The tongue is supposed to be a tool, but this one I'm, I'm checking to see if you can reach. So as you're doing this, pretend you have a cinnamon bear or a chocolate, something stuck on your back molars. I want to see if you can reach back there and how you have to compensate to do it. So some people can do it, but they have to stay close because they can't reach. That's a tongue tie. I have some people that they have to move the chin to do it. When you have a tongue tie, it's tied to what? the floor of your mouth. So there's a reason that you do this, okay? Um, ideally, I want to see this. So that just shows that my tongue can reach. It There certainly isn't a restriction problem and that's what we're looking for when we're looking for reach, okay? So when you do it, see how far you can reach. Um, people will email me and say, well, I did this and I can reach to my first molar. You guys, your first molar is right here. It's the first one that you can see. If that's all you can reach, then you have a problem. If you can reach all the way back, um, you can put your, your finger on your chin and it doesn't wiggle, then maybe you're okay. But if you have to close way down before you reach, then there's a concern. Let's see what's next. Okay, I wanna show you this slide and then I'll come back. So the next tests are click, suction and hold, or click, suction, and then suction and hold. These are the biggies. Um, on this picture here, it's showing you a suction and hold. Depending on the industry jargon, you might've heard it called a cave. Uh, it's, it's all the same. Okay, this, the tongue suctioned up. So I have my clients demonstrate clicking in somebody with a tongue tie. Typically, they can't do it or they do it like this. The difference here, remember, you're using the joint for something that the joint isn't meant to be used for. So um, a finger on the chin is great to stabilize. But as I have somebody going through this, I'm looking to see how far down they are closed because that also tells me what I'm looking for with a tongue tie, okay? So first, check to see if you can click. Next, we're gonna look at suction. Suction's the Mac Daddy. This um, suction and suction and hold, these are my benchmarks for somebody being ready for a tie, uh, a phrenectomy. So first, I want to see how somebody can suction. This picture right there, that's how you should suction. All the way back, all the way to your molars, and no bingo wings hanging down. So we call that occlusal spillage, when, when the tongue is hanging down below. You don't want that. You don't want your tongue in between your teeth. 
So the goal is to be able to suction all the way up. Obviously, if you have a tongue tie, that's hard. Or you might be able to suction all the way up, but you might be that closed, which tells you you also have a problem there. Um, so first, I want you to suction. See how far back you can suction. Ideally, I want you to be able to do it all the way back. And then how far can you suction, or how long can you suction and hold? You guys, you're gonna be doing this for minutes. The reason this is so important, suction and hold, is because it helps the doctor see what the heck they're doing. It helps you keep the tongue out of their way and you get a smaller wound when they can go in and you've got some muscle tone, you've got some control. You don't have a doctor just going in there after at some fuzzy target. Um, suction and hold is the is the benchmark. Um, and I have shared this with you guys before. I shared a, a slide last night where I had a doctor say, I've never had somebody so prepared. This is the biggie, that's the benchmark. So you work up to it. If you can't do it right now, what I want you to feel is how far back are you suctioning? Is it the front quarter of your tongue? Is it the middle of the tongue? Is it most of it? Uh, can you get the tongue suctioned up, but you're really, really closed down? Okay, so that's what we're looking for there. And then touch the upper lip without compensation. This is hard. In this picture, you can see that I have my tongue up to the upper lip. My upper lip is not working to cheat. It's not working to reach down and help. A lot of people, as soon as they try and work the tongue, the, the upper lip is coming and rolling. That's not what we're after, okay? So let me demonstrate that with a full scream. There's nothing going on here. I have full control. Um, some people who have a tongue tie, they, um, I, I demonstrate this to them and they just look at me like the lights are on but nobody's home. They can't figure out how to do that without using the lips, okay? The lips are an important tool but they also help you compensate. Let me see, okay, so, so that's it as far as the functional assessment. And when I'm doing an exam with somebody, we're running through all of those things. I have them do this, 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 this. I'm looking at everything, I'm taking notes. Boom, I'm ready to move on. But the last thing that I do look at is how did all that feel? Uh, I did an exam with a nine-year-old today and when I asked her how all of that stuff felt doing all of those movements, she said it was painful, it was uncomfortable, and it was tiring. You know, so what I want you thinking about is First of all, was it impossible or painful? If that was the case, then it's probably not a secret that you have a tongue tie. Um, was it tiring or difficult? <coughs> Some people will say just moving through those few functional assessments that I have them do, they feel like they've put in a workout. That also tells them how, how trying myofunctional therapy is going to be for them. Um, so when you say, hey, that was tiring or that was difficult, but it wasn't impossible or painful, then I want you to think about like, what does the rest of your checklist look like? It's all about function. But if you're saying, oh my gosh, this was miserable, it was uncomfortable, and this thing looks like you spilled your ink on it, then that tells you, yes, you have a concern, okay? And then last, what about compensation? I talked about the lips. Um, when you do those exercises, are you using your, your platysma here? Are you trying to lift from, er, from everything that you've got with your, from your clavicle up? I always compare it to, you know, if you lift a box that's too heavy and you're not supposed to, it always seems like you just use your back to finish lifting it over, whatever. That's not what you want. So as I'm watching somebody demonstrate those exercises or those tests, I'm watching here because when you do them, you shouldn't have anything here, okay? So if you can do those and everything is so hard, that's another answer there also. Okay, we're moving on. Let's now talk about 
dental and ortho history. Let me have a drink here. Okay. So this, re it, it kind of varies on what information I'm gathering from this as far as being related to a tongue tie. So if you have lots of large spaces or a lot of room in your mouth, I know that people are self-conscious about that, but that's a good thing because if you have a crossbite or if you have crowding, that's telling me that you have misguided craniofacial growth. Um, a crossbite is when the teeth aren't lining up as they're so, supposed to. So if you were to bite down naturally and you had a tooth on the bottom, say that was in front of the tooth on the top, that's a crossbite. Sometimes you can have a crossbite for a whole section. Sometimes it's just one tooth. It's very common in children and some providers will just say, oh, he'll outgrow it. And then other providers, we, we want the intervention done now so that we're not waiting for them to outgrow it. Um, what I mean by, by misguided craniofacial growth, take, take me for example, you can look at me, my, my vertical jaw angle, my long narrow face, which we call horse face in the industry because it's like this long, you can see how gravity affected me. I was a mouth breather and my tongue was down. So that's misguided craniofacial growth. We definitely should be looking that, for that in our children. Since I'm talking to adults, what that tells me when, when, when I'm meeting somebody is I'm, I'm looking at them and I say, okay, well, I know based on her facial structure that she was a mouth breather and she probably did not have her tongue in the roof of the mouth because of how narrow the arch is. My arch is narrow, uh, but that's because my tongue was down. So uh, my tongue still fits up there now, but it always wasn't up there. So I'm high and narrow and I have this long facial structure. Um, next, did you have previous ortho? So when I'm meeting with somebody and they've been to the orthodontist, have they had previous ortho, which means they had a structure, um, they had crooked teeth. There, there was some reason for an orthodontist to, to straighten their teeth, okay? Because if you know anything about Dr. Weston Price or a lot of providers who are studying um, ancient skulls, those people way back then, all of their teeth came in beautifully. They had enough space for everything, so they didn't need ortho. So that tells me something. If you have had ortho relapse, this is my jam, you guys. I was getting braces for the third time. Uh, $6,000 in my pocket. And finally, the orthodontist said, you know, it's you, it's not us. And so I get a lot of middle-aged women or maybe even in, into their 50s that are wanting to fix their ortho relapse. If you don't have enough space in your face, if you don't have a big enough foundation, you're not going to be able to put all the seats in, okay? So that's misguided craniofacial growth. So perhaps looking at the big picture rather than just getting braces again is gonna be helpful. Um, expansion, did you have expansion? Did you have expansion and anybody ever say, your tongue needs to be up there? Did you have expansion and anybody ever say, do you have a tongue tie? Um, it, it happens all the time where people had expansion. I have a client right now who has been in ortho. He's a junior in high school. He's been in ortho since third grade and had expansion three times. And they only worried about his tongue tie last year. And it was so frustrating because I feel like as an orthodontist, why did you let this kiddo go through all of these thousands of dollars and years of therapy and you just now looked at a tongue tie and you've done three rounds of expansion? Has somebody told you you need expansion? So that's another option on here. Um, teeth pulled. So you, when you pull teeth out of a small mouth, you guys, you create a smaller mouth. If you had teeth pulled, you probably have an airway concern or you probably have a, a, a space issue. So if you had teeth pulled and you have a tongue tie, then that does not surprise me. If you're a parent here and you've got somebody who's wanting to pull teeth out of your kid, make sure you watch that video that I talked about last night, the six things that parents should know because it, it, it happens all the time, but it shouldn't be happening. 
Okay, you have to address, you can't, you can't pull teeth to make room. You can't solve it that way. Um, last, habit corrector. If you had spikes, rakes, anything in the roof of your mouth, bead, the bluegrass bead, anything like that, you guys, it's a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. You might have fixed the tongue thrust, but you probably developed something different. I know a lot of these appliances, they cause you to put your tongue in a different place. So while you might not do, be doing what you did, you're probably still doing things wrong. And then last, when I'm looking at um, dental stuff, decay. So I talk about the tongue being a tool. If you can't reach to clean, I have lots of clients with decay. So if you're wondering about a tongue tie, that's kind of a red flag also, especially if you have decay um, on the molars or on the buckle, on the cheek surfaces of your teeth. And then last, high narrow palate. So again, craniofacial growth anomaly, but if, if somebody comes to me, they're wondering if they have a tongue tie, I already can tell that they have a low postured tongue when I look and they have a high narrow palate. The reason that is, is because the tongue isn't up there. It's not up there spreading that mid face to help the rest grow. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's keep trucking on here. I gotta see how much, woo, I better speed up. Um, speech history. Um, so one thing that I wanna say, I know that people who are either here or will be watching it, there's a lot of speech therapists. And you know, my background is dental hygiene and I, I just pray that if you're a speech therapist and you're watching this, you're watching it because you want to learn more from me and you know how identifying this, how important it is. Because I have so many people who come to me, they have everything marked down here. They've got a history of speech therapy. They have trouble with the most common sounds that are related to a tongue tie, T-D-L-N-R. They have a lisp. Um, a lot of these people speak fast and they, well, some have trouble speaking fast because they stumble over their words, but I have a lot of clients who speak fast because they hope you don't pick up on their speech impediment. So they're hoping that if they talk fast, you're not going to notice. But I think that speech therapists, I mean, you guys are, you've got something that I can't offer. I have to refer my clients out for speech therapy. And so I, I really hope and wish that more speech therapists knew and did this. Um, so the case of my granddaughter, she had th speech therapy for three years. Nobody lifted and looked. Nobody looked uh, under her tongue. They basically just stopped because she wasn't getting anywhere and they just gave up on her. Nobody realized that when you have a tongue tie, you can't be successful in some areas of speech. Half of the muscles of the tongue are responsible for shape, half are responsible for placement. And if you can't have the right combination, you can't be successful in speech therapy. I have a lot of clients who go through my therapy, they have a phrenectomy, and they are beautiful. They start right into speech therapy and they're, they're successful right away. Some other things that come across, oh, we are not taught to, we were taught not to look. So I, I hope it's Deanna. Um, so I'm assuming that you're in speech. So that's interesting. I would love you to answer a little bit more of that so I can look at it after here. I, I have never heard that you guys are taught not to look. I have been told that you're just not taught to look. And that's the same with hygiene. We know how to look for a tongue. We know what a tongue tie is. Um, the low hanging fruit ones, um, the ones that really need help, you know, those, those go undiagnosed. Nobody thinks anything about it. I'm embarrassed to look, think about the things in the past that were related to a tongue tie that I didn't know. Um, I graduated 10 years ago. Yes, this will be a great conversation. So if you guys are chatting, tell me what your background is and really what your level of knowledge is about this because it, it is just so frustrating to me. I get clients that have been in speech therapy for 18 months and nobody ever looked under the tongue. So I, I don't know. I don't know how we solve all these problems. Um, but I would love to finish this conversation or keep it going in the Facebook group. Um, so more about what I'm looking for in relation to somebody 
who who might have a tongue tie and and their speech um, very common there's a speech delay so like in my granddaughter's case talking was difficult she didn't want to talk so she just didn't but she could say you know thank you or please or whatever so she learned sign language she also learned her own language so she created so she wouldn't say I'm hungry can I have a cookie anything like that she would say num 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 and so she was a very brilliant girl but the reason she was saying different words is so that it was easier a lot of kids have a delay going to, learning to talk because it's just a lot of work um, some people who have a tongue tie they have trouble with stuttering or mumbling they have trouble projecting their voice and more important you guys there are social implications of somebody having a tongue tie and this is also saddens me why it gets overlooked I've had clients, I've, I've have watched both a male and a female go from having a whole lifetime of being called antisocial, unapproachable, um, bitchy, shy, introvert, you know, all of these things. Um, the gentleman told me that he, he just thought he was shy, like society told him he was shy. He, he had a tongue tie. He didn't want to talk. He didn't want to go <clears throat> to that party. He didn't want to socialize. He didn't want to have friends. And God forbid, did he want to go to a party and have a glass of wine because that really makes it worse. So what I got to watch firsthand with both of them, their personalities just blossomed as they had their release. You know, we did everything right. They had excellent results. And their personalities just came out because they could talk. They didn't have to worry about stumbling over their words. They didn't have to worry about being self-conscious. So I always say that there's um, there are social implications of having a tie. So um, speech is probably one of the biggest areas that gets overlooked. Remember, myofunctional therapy is not speech therapy. Myofunctional therapy sets you up so that you can be successful with speech therapy. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox with that. Let's talk about tension and posture. So first let's talk about headaches and migraines. Um, on the discovery checklist, it says frequent headaches. And I get a lot of people that say, I have migraines and if I could have the magic unicorn dust that makes them go away, I'm, I'm all for it. So as a migraine sufferer myself, I caution anybody who comes to me and they want to focus on one symptom and it's very often migraines. And the reason that I say that is because migraines can be caused by so many different things. Tension, headaches, that's one thing, but a migraine, they can be caused by smells, hormones, structural misalignment, so, and, and others. I think that, that there's like six classifications of what can cause them. I have never had a tongue tie. I have migraines that are caused by structural misalignment. When you have a tongue tie, you guys, it rolls you forward, therefore affecting your posture. When it rolls you forward, it compresses your diaphragm, so it can't work properly. So I know when I have somebody with a tongue tie, they're also not breathing right. Um, even if they are breathing through their nose, they're, they can't because they, they're compressed. Dr. Zoggy says it best when he says, when you have a tongue tie, it's like having a small when you need a large. So you're rolled forward. So if you have migraines that are caused by structural misalignment, then potentially a phrenectomy is gonna help that. But I never want you to go into therapy with me or anybody else hoping that that just one thing, if, if all you wanna fix is migraines, I, I want you to caution and be open to realizing that you've got other myofunctional impairment. Um, jaw, facial pain, and tension. So super duper common. There is so much going on with this joint, okay? The most complex joint in the body. Um, I'm in the middle of a big course on the jaw and it still is just mind blowing to me how all of this stuff literally is tied together. I thought I knew it all, definitely don't. Um, a lot of people have pain and tension here, okay? If you're reporting that you always go to the chiropractor, if you're chronically tense, if you go to the chiropractor and you it doesn't last long, so like you're addicted to going to the chiropractor, you're probably going to be pleasantly surprised once you have a release, we can get you upright, get your shoulders back, get rid of the forward head posture, that's going to be helpful. 
Um, let me see what else I look for here. Forward head posture. Um, this is concerning for a couple reasons. First of all, when we started standing and walking, forward head posture became a thing because we started doing this when we needed more air because it changes the angle. Air has to go in and take a right, a, a 90 degree angle. If you look at a dog who is not bipedal, the air goes in and, and it doesn't have to take any corners. So when somebody has forward head posture, first we wonder about airway concern, but we also look at how it affects posture. So I, a couple years ago, was treated for forward head posture. For every inch forward, you're putting an additional 12 pounds on the spine. So let me go to the main camera here. So a great example is if you have your hand here and you have a bowling ball, and if you start to hold that out from your body, it's going to be harder to support and the same is for our head. So when I evaluate somebody and I'm looking at their posture, I'm trying to determine their myofunctional impairment, whether they have a tongue tie, and I see this, I'm thinking two things. We have structural misalignment issue, we have a connective tissue issue, which is the tie, um, but we also have an airway issue too. You guys, this isn't a little old lady with osteoporosis. That's that forward head posture. So once you have a release, if you have a tie, you're going to learn that, oh my gosh, I can get my ears back over my shoulders. I can get my shoulder blades on the seat of the car. I have had one person so far in all of the clients that I have seen who did not have in immediate relief from all of this stuff. Um, and she was 23. And I and I know she's a terrible example because she didn't get a complete release. I wanted her to have it done again and she said, heck no, that was painful, I don't wanna do it. But this tension part is something that I see improved in everybody. So while I never wanna sound like I'm a, a used car salesman, if you suspect that you have a tie and you're wondering if it's gonna make your headaches or your, your tension, all of that stuff go away, I want you to really consider consider doing it. Um, okay, and last thing I wanna say about the, the TM joint is the only thing that will hold you back from doing therapy is if you've got a really bad acute situation, but you can take care of that in a few days. Normally, I said, do whatever, you know, anti-inflammatories, and then you're good to go. So, um, and and we, um, when I have clients that have joint issues, we have to find a happy medium because I want them to do this and they want to do this, which is nothing. So we have to kind of customize and find a, a happy place. So if you have a jaw joint issue and you have a tongue tie, don't not have the phrenectomy done because of the jaw because the tongue muscle, the styloglossus, starts at the tip of the tongue and it inserts back here by the joint. That's the culprit for a lot of issues. That combined with the fact that if you're using this joint to do things, the job of the tongue, then you can be creating a repetitive strain injury. All right, let's see what's left here. Okay, last sleep, gosh. So, snoring, loud breathing, if you sleep in strange positions. This isn't really, I, I don't see that a lot for adults, definitely for kids. If you're sleeping with your chin back, you guys, that's self CPR. You're doing it to get air, okay? Um, if you're grinding or clenching, that is your body's 911 call. It's not normal. Um, waking easy or often, insomnia. So I get this question a lot, and this is for not just people who have tongue ties, but if you're awake, you're alive, right? And so that's why a lot of people who have sleep disordered breathing or who have sleep apnea have insomnia. My 24 year old suffers from this terribly. She's got upper airway resistance syndrome and sleep apnea, and she has insomnia really bad. And it's basically her body says, well, last night you tried to suffocate me all night, so if we're alive, or if I'm awake, then I'm alive, so let's just watch another episode of Grey's Anatomy or watch another movie. Um, and so it, it's so important to understand why this ha is happening so that you can fix it. Um, restless sleeping, waking unref unrefreshed, daytime fatigue, um, erectile dysfunction. So that's a touchy subject. 
a lot of men will not address the concerns with sleep apnea until they have problems with erectile dysfunction. Uh, and I have a lot of wives who reach out to me and ask that. So if that's a situation in your family, if, if you're a male here watching this and that applies to you, a lot of men, once they hit that point, then they're ready to address sleep apnea. Um, see, so frequent urination. A lot of people will say, I have a tiny bladder, it's my prostate, and what else do I hear? Um, bladder, prostate, and I drink a lot of water during the day. If you're not sleeping right, if you're not breathing right, if you're grinding your teeth, if you have an airway crisis, you guys, your body is in freak out mode and that's why you're going to the bathroom all the time. So I'm not gonna get into more heavy science of that, but just know it's not your prostate. If you have a whole bunch of things marked on the sleep section here, then that's a concern. Um, having headaches in the morning and having previous sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing diagnosis. That happens so much. You guys, I, I'm going to go into this more tomorrow when we talk about what all this means and the repercussions of doing nothing. We're going to talk about sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea is the most expensive chronic degenerative disease out there right now. If you have been diagnosed with it and you're doing nothing about it, that's terrible. It's very, it's, it's just terrible. So the good thing is if you have a tongue tie and you have sleep apnea, well, that is going to help remove some of the obstacle because if you have a tongue tie, you can't get the tongue to the roof of the mouth to maintain the proper oral posture. And also it's like if you had too small of a shoe and your heel was hanging out. If you have apnea and a tongue tie, we gotta get rid of the tongue tie. Uh, a lot of providers will, will treat you for something but not look for something else. So that's part of why we're having this conversation. The upward sleepiness scale, this goes in all of my kits. I have all of my clients do it. Um, I have a version for children, the pediatric sleep questionnaire. If you take this and you score um, 11 or higher, have a conversation with your doctor. We're gonna go more into this tomorrow. Um, if there's somebody that you know, that's one of the, uh, the reasons why I do these educational events, because maybe you don't have a concern, but maybe your dad is sucking the curtains off the wall when he sleeps at night. It's not just, um, it's not just a nuisance, you guys. It's not just inconvenient it affects somebody their partner sleep it affects their health so share this information if there's somebody that you suspect or that 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 has been diagnosed and is doing nothing okay and then last on the the checklist is behavior this isn't really so much for adults it i i wanted to make sure that i went over it so that you could think about it if you had kiddos that had concerns um, a lot of children who are diagnosed with some of these conditions have sleep apnea. And so, um, and, and some people have been medicated their whole life. Really what applies for doctor, um, that what applies for adults is the depression and anxiety. Um, most of our population is being medicated for anxiety, for depression. I mean, I'm long, young kids, five and six, I'm getting them, and they're just really anxious people. But that's what I want you to, to realize here. If you have incorrect tongue posture, you, or incorrect breathing, you're not sleeping well, you're gonna see some concerns here. Um, okay, so let's wrap up here. I had a great question today of suggested books. So uh, the latest one I'm reading right now is Breath by James Nestor. If you want to dive deeper, that's a great one. I talk a lot about stuff from Dr. Stephen Lynn, which is the dental diet, but the rest of those are great. If, if this is you and you wonder about tongue ties, um, if you wonder about everything as a whole, as a well, as a, as being well, as a whole person, rather than just one piece, 
then read. I mean, these are all great. Um, I like Why We Sleep. I will warn you, it is science heavy. So if you want help falling asleep at night, it's great. You're only going to get a couple pages done at a time. Let's see what else I have here.